particularly special for me. Dr. Ginsburg has been on our wish list for a long time, and it's really, really exciting that he's here tonight, and I'm really glad that you're here to hear him. He is the author of two books, and we have them for sale, and if we run out, which I'm sure we will, please go to Amazon.com, particularly for his new book, Letting Go, because the more that people order it online, the better it will be, and you'll want to share this book. I could read his list of accomplishments, it's as long as my arm, but I think, as I said, the testament to all of the people who come back to hear him again after listening to him for three hours this morning speaks for itself. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ken Ginsburg. It is such a pleasure to be here. I really had a great time with this community today. I was overwhelmingly impressed with the parents that I met and the counselors I met this morning. I'm also, I have to say, overwhelmingly impressed with the lineup of speakers you have. Um, I know who these people are in those pamphlets. I know most of them. Um, I don't count, but the rest of them are really impressive people. <laughs> and uh, Wendy, who's your next speaker, is fun and motivating and really clear. Another person who's later in the year is going to be Dr. Rainey, who wrote the book Spark, who's one of my favorite books. I'm going to reference it um, a few times tonight. Trust me, Guild is doing something right, and your committee is doing something right. Um, I also have to say that um, when uh, the principal was starting and saying, you know, so I have all these degrees, and I thought I knew what I was doing, and then you have your own kid, it's the same for me. If you walk out of here and think um, he's doing everything right in his home, that's not true. Okay? Um, having a child is like having your heart on the outside of your body. That's the best description I can use. It's the thing that you absolutely love. And you can know anything about resilience. Like, literally, I wrote a book on resilience. Okay? You can know anything about it. You can have all the people telling you about how important it is to let your kid fall down sometimes. And the truth, is it's hard as hell, because it's like having the heart, your heart on the outside of your body. So the best that you can do is struggle to do your very best. That's the best any of us can hope for. With that said, I want to talk tonight just about raising resilient kids and making kids who really are more likely to be authentically successful in the world. So let's begin by asking the question, what's your childhood look like? Give me, what do you want childhood to look like? Playing outside. Playing outside. Fun. Fun. Creative. Creative. Carefree. 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 Loving. Loving. Perfect. Smiles. <laughs> Friendships. Relationships. Traditions. Traditions. Innocent. Innocent. Beautiful. And who is childhood for? <laughs> it's a tough one. Because we care so much about being outstanding parents that on some level, our definition of how we are successful has to do with whether or not our child is smiling. It has something to do with the bumper sticker that we're going to put on the back of our car. That doesn't make us bad people. It doesn't make us selfish. It doesn't make us phony. It's a reality of parenting in this decade and in the last decade. It's a reality. It doesn't make us bad. But the first step we have to look at is, who are, am I really trying to produce? And the answer is, I'm trying to produce a child. And here's two children. I learned something new every day, but not a darn thing I can put on a resume. <laughs> what we are trying to do is raise kids who are going to be successful. And the first thing that we have to ask is, what does that mean? What are the ingredients that you need in order to be successful in life? Name them for me. Yeah. Happy. Say what? Yeah. Happy. Confident. Confident. Passion. Passion. Perseverance. Wow. Resilient. I missed a couple. Collaborative. Collaborative. Work ethic. Help seeking. Again, great answers. If we had an auditorium full of your kids, which I've had, not in this particular community, but in communities near here, communities around the country, you would it would break your heart what some of them will say. They will say some of the things that we're saying. But they're also going to say, I want to have a really nice car, a beautiful woman, and be rich. And it's mostly about having um, the uh, fat envelope. Which fat envelope are you going to get from what college? And 
that defines success. All right? Which means that in some way, they're missing the broader message of what it means to be authentically successful. So when we think about what it means to be authentically successful, the first thing you have to think about is that what you're really trying to do is produce a kid who will be a successful 35-year-old. That's the biggest mistake we make in parenting. We are measuring things in the short term, and we're measuring whether the child is smiling now. It's not about whether the child smiles now. It is about whether that child will smile and be happy when they're 35, 40, and 50. Which means, will they like what they're doing in their life? Will they feel good about it? That's how we look at happiness. What else do we need? We need for kids who are going to be generous, compassionate, and empathetic, right? Because that's the only way they're going to be committed to repairing the world. The only reason, the only way that kids are going to turn around and make my world better and your world better when we're older is if they have compassion and empathy. What else do they need? They need perseverance, tenacity, and a work ethic. They need grit, stick to it a bit, a commitment to get something done. They need that. What else? They need to have social and emotional intelligence, meaning that they need to have a collaborative spirit, to have an instinct on what other people are thinking and knowing how to communicate with them. They need to, in the same vein, be able to take constructive criticism, because it's constructive criticism that is going to enable them to be able to do well in work and to improve, right? We also need them to be creative and to be innovative. Why? Because all of the best ideas have never been thought of yet. No one knows what they are. It's going to be the out-of-box thinkers who are going to create those ideas. And we need them to be able to deal with adversity. Because as much as we love to wrap them in a bubble wrap, the truth is that life is going to be hard sometimes. And we want for them to be able to bounce back from adversity. So again, I need kids to be successful 35-year-olds. Meaning I need them to be happy, to be compassionate, to be generous, to be empathetic. I need them to be, have tenacity and a hard work ethic. I need them to be creative and innovative. I need them social and emotional intelligence, including having the ability to deal with constructive criticism and to be able to uh, if, uh, utilize feedback productively. I need them to be creative and innovative, and I need them to be resilient. I need them to be a lot of things. But can you imagine that those are the ingredients you really need to be successful? Does that sound reasonable? In the next hour and a half, we're going to be talking about building resilience in kids, building kids who are authentically successful. And I want you to hear those words that I've said over and over again. Because the problem with the way we are raising some kids now is that they are actually, we are undercutting some of the key ingredients of success. So the question is, do we have to make a choice between success and happiness? Because when we talked about childhood, which is how we began, all the words were happy words. It was about being innocent. It's what we want. We want our kids to smile today. That makes us feel like good parents, and it just, they're our heart. We want them to be happy. And the question is whether by indulging them now or making them happy now, by taking care of their emotional needs now, are we undercutting their ability to be successful in the future? And let me tell you something. I have two 16-year-olds. They're, the, they're the love of my life. They're identical girls. I'd give anything for them. And if, and I enjoy them, I enjoy spending time with them and playing games with them and taking walks with them. And if I had to give any of that up to make them successful in the long run, even if it made them miserable, anxious, even if it meant they had to study 10 hours a day in order to be authentically successful, and I thought that in making that decision, I was preparing them for a lifetime of success, I would do it. I would do whatever I did, could do to make them, even if it made them miserable now, it would be worth it in the short run if they were successful in the long run. I would hate myself for doing it, my life wouldn't be as happy, but I would make that choice. But I am thoroughly convinced that this is not that kind of a choice. That in fact, if we put it into, if we take care of kids' emotions now, we are and, and stop pressuring them and to the degree we're pressuring them, reduce some of the stress that's in their life, not only will it make them happier now, it will make them more successful in the future. And that's the case that I want to build tonight, part of the case I want to build tonight. So let's think about it. We want more than anything for the kid to get into the top college. 
I mean, if we're just going to be honest with ourselves, that's what we want. We want the kids to get into the top college because we believe that that's going to predict success for the rest of their life. Here's the fact. It doesn't. The fact is that getting into the top college does influence whether or not you get your, where you get your first job. It does. All right? But what, is, but what makes a difference in when, whether or not you get your second job? It's how you did in your first job. And how long are kids staying at the first job in 2011? So 18 months to 24 months. Kids, I'm in my first job. I'm in my 28th year of my first job right now. Okay? It is a different generation. What's happening is kids are getting their first job because you're more likely to go to Northwestern than you are to community college if you're a big computer firm. I'm not going to lie to you. But what's going to make a difference in whether or not you get your second job is all about job performance. And think about it. You call up someone on the phone and you say to them, um, tell me about Johnny. Tell me about what he's like. Does he take constructive criticism well? Is he creative? Does he come up with good ideas? Does he collaborate? These are the questions you're going to ask, right? You're not going to ask what he got on his SATs. You're not. You're going to ask these questions. And what we do when we pressure too, kids too much in the present is we actually undercut those other things. This movement, now you may not realize it, but a lot of the speakers that you've gotten are people who are challenged success. Race to Nowhere borrowed people from challenge success. That's who Madeline is, that's who Wendy is, that's who I am. Challenge Success is an organization centered out of Stanford. It's about redefining success. All right? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you who began paying for it, who got us off our feet. It's business people. It's business people who are very dissatisfied with the 20-somethings. Because they're coming in and interviewing with their mothers. They're calling, <laughs> really, they're calling their mothers um, when they get upset, and they're not taking constructive criticism. Because of what's happened to this generation, and I think we can, we can reverse it. Resilience. The core of today's talk. What's it about? It's about the ability to overcome adversity. The ability to, um, the capacity to bounce back. When someone is trying to push you down, you're somehow still going to rise. What resilience is, is a mindset also. It is the mindset of when something bad happens to you, do you view that as a catastrophe or as an opportunity? Do you believe that when God closes a door, a window becomes open? Is that your view? Because that's the mindset of resilience. And how are you going to view a problem? Are you going to see a problem as a real tiger that's so ferocious it's going to attack you? Because every stress reaction you have in your body is all about being prepared to run from a tiger. That's all you have. You don't have a stress reaction that says, I have to do an extra shift. You don't have a stress reaction that says, I might lose my job. You don't have a stress reaction if you're a kid that says, I have to study for a geometry test. The only stress reaction you have as a human being is, oh my god, there's a tiger chasing my butt. Which means that if you are not able to differentiate a real tiger from a paper tiger, you will be running from that tiger during the geometry test. And you will be a nervous wreck, and you will not be able to focus. Why? Because when a tiger's chasing you, you're not supposed to turn around and say, let me just do one more theorem, OK? It's not what's supposed to happen. So do you have the mindset where you know the difference between a real tiger versus a paper tiger? Resilience is uneven, all right? You cannot produce a kid. You know, I will not come into your house and make it so that your child can be resilient in every setting. Sometimes life is so stressful at home that people use up all of their energy and they fall apart in school or vice versa. It is uneven. There's also nothing I could do if I came into your house to make it so that we could produce invulnerable children, right? We could wrap your kids in downy quilts, we could wrap them in bubble wrap, but we couldn't make them invulnerable because it's not possible. Furthermore, we wouldn't want them to be. Let's go back to the definition of success. The first thing I talked about was being compassionate and having empathy, right? You know, look at your own life. Ask any healer, any really good doctor, any really good social worker, any really good teacher, anyone who really knows how to work with people, they'll all tell you a story. I'm doing this because I know what this needed. If you look at my life, the best thing that ever happened to me was 17. 
the worst year of my life. But you know what? I am who I am because of 17. My ability to empathize with human beings is because I know what it takes to make a young person feel heard, to make a young person feel like seeking help without stigma is worthwhile. Why? Because I never sought help. Why? Because there was too much shame. But I know exactly what it would have taken, and now I am that guy. We all have stories. We can't protect our kids from developing their own. Resilience is not a character trait. It's not like temperament. It's not like a kid's either resilient or not, and it's permanent. No. It is about supports and circumstances. It's about what we put into kids' life. There's almost 50 years of research that looks at what it takes to make a human being resilient and what it makes, what are the protective factors that a human being needs to be able to bounce back. And here's what it says. Here's the bottom line. I can tell you everything about resilience while standing on one foot. It's that simple. <coughs> Those kids who make it despite difficult circumstances are kids who had an adult who believed in them unconditionally and who held them to high expectation. Why? Because um, kids live up to or down to the expectations adults set for them. Who should that adult be ideally? That one adult. Ideally, that's your parent. But sometimes it's nurses and doctors and rabbis and ministers and coaches and aunts and grandmas. All right, who believe in you unconditionally. Is that like dudes? It's okay to do drugs. Is that what unconditional belief means? No. It means I'm not going anywhere. My presence, my love, is not dependent on your performance. All right? It is not dependent on your behavior, certainly not dependent on your grade. And when I hold you up to high expectations, of course that means effort. But does that mean result? Does that mean I expect you to get all A's? No. It is I know who you are. You're my little girls in truth for me. You're my little girls who used to um, uh, make me take a light beam and walk the moths outside rather than swat them. Or you were so worried they weren't going to find their ways out once we turned off the lights on the inside that we had to walk them outside so they could be with their moth grandmas. <laughs> you might be talking back to me right now. You might have an attitude. But you're the little girls who used to run up the street and say, Abby's home, Abby's home, Abby's home. You're the little girls who made me stop by the side of the road and pick up the pink teddy bear because it was soiled and you knew it would be happier if it was clean. That's who you are. You might be talking back to me now when you're 16, but I love you to death and I know who you are. That's what I mean by a high expectation because you didn't live up to or down to your expectations of them. That's everything in resilience theory in a nutshell while standing on one foot. The rest is commentary. That's it. The rest of the night doesn't count if you get what that means. I'm about to show you the um, 17 model of resilience. This is the American Academy of Pediatrics model. It's a model that I synthesized for the AAP. Um, it basically puts all resilience theories and blends them all together. The first thing a human being needs in order to be resilient is to be confident, which is one of those words you guys said in terms of success, right? You need to be confident. Where do you get confidence from? We thought in the 80s and 90s, which is when the kids who were down in college were raised, we thought that the way in which you needed, uh, that was, the way in which we built confidence was to build self-esteem. So as a result, what we did is we lavished praise on people. We gave everybody awards just for showing up. Um, everybody, every kids, you are all special as a each of you, you're as unique as a snowflake. All right, that's how we raised kids. Um, the soccer mom and dad sit here. What happens when someone falls on the ground now? Do they get up by themselves? Only after all the adults have applauded. When all the adults applaud is when you know you can get up. So we did that thinking we were going to make people happy. But what happened? What happened is that people uh, don't always feel special as a butterfly. It's the truth. Sometimes you just don't feel that special. And unless people tell you that that's okay, then you feel absolutely awful. So the self-esteem generation crashed during adolescence. They crashed because they didn't know how to recover. They knew how to be praised, but they didn't know how to recover. Real confidence comes from confidence. It comes from people recognizing what you are doing well. All right? It comes from people recognizing your skills and supporting you to develop more skills. It's about having those kind of skills that allow you to navigate your pure world. 
as much as we wish kids could just say, I'm sorry, I will not participate, I'm morally, ethically, and spiritually opposed, it's much more complicated than that. Do you have the skills where you can navigate the world? Do you have the skills where you can look someone in the eye and say, sir, I think I'm the man for the job? Those are interview skills. These are the kind of skills we need kids to have. And we can support these competencies, or we can undermine them by how we communicate with kids. We're going to be talking about that later. Next is connection. The bottom line is, I'm going to feel more confident in being able to bounce back if I think someone's got my back. Even better if I have concentric circles of connection in my life. Not only my family, but my extended family. Not only my extended family, but my community, my team, my church. The more that I have concentric circles of connection I have, the better. Next, character. Because you know what? You can have those other three and still be a pretty ugly person. Character. It's about whether or not you are going to do the right thing when no one's watching. Will you have integrity? This is where work ethic and tenacity comes in. Do you have a stick to it this, or do you feel entitled for the world to be handled to you, to be handed to you? Do you know that you get what only what you earn? Contribution, tikkun olam, to have the kids have a sense that it is their job to repair the world, to, for that for kids to know that they matter. So this is true in all of our policy discussions about kids. Are there kids in the room? Are we believing that their voice matters? Are we believing that people in our family, do that the kids and what they say matters? What else? The ultimate act of resilience. During times of war, during times of pestilence, whenever something gets really bad, the people who are gonna survive are the people who can turn to another human being and say, brother, I need a hand. Those are the people who are gonna survive. What is it that allows you to reach out to another human being without shame and to seek help? It is the experience of having served. When you serve, when you volunteer, when you contribute to your community, you learn something. You learn that it feels good. And when you know that it feels good, it means that when later in life you need to reach out to another human being, you're gonna know the days you have that life. All right, but it's more than that. Your community has to protect teenagers from the message that's out there about teenagers. The message out there about teenagers is that teenagers are the source of problems. All right, they're spoiled, they're entitled, they're violent, they're drunkards, they're hypersexed people. That's the message we give about teenagers. Who has kids who are like 10 or 11 now? So what's gonna happen if you haven't had teenagers yet? What's gonna happen is that um, when your kids are about 11, 12, 13, all of a sudden the parents of the 14 and 15 year olds are gonna begin telling you their horror stories. And they're gonna begin saying, put on your seatbelt, and you're gonna mourn the loss of your innocent child. All right, the truth is teenagers are the coolest people in the world, and it's some of the best times in parenting. Some of the hardest, but some of the best. Why? Your sense of humor develops, and you get a sense of irony and sarcasm that's really fun. If you can tolerate it, it's really fun. <laughs> and they're beginning to think in abstract ways and it's enormously good. But what happens is all of a sudden you have these 12 year olds going, and remember now he's getting nervous. I think I'm supposed to be in trouble. You have to remember what the fundamental question of adolescence is. The fundamental question of adolescence is, who am I? And am I normal? The 11 and 12 year olds look around and they say, you know what? When people are talking about teenagers, they seem to be problems. I guess I better become problem, a problem. I was in Fort Sill in Oklahoma about a month ago, and his father of a 12-year-old said that his son had just said to him, Daddy, um, you know, I know I'm going to be a teenager soon, and I know the teenagers are really moody, and I know they really cause a lot of trouble. I don't want to cause you any trouble, and I'm not feeling moody. Is that all right? <laughs> we set kids up for failure when we don't, we don't recognize their beauty and we appreciate their sarcasm sometimes is about challenging us in ways that we should be challenged. Not just us, but as society. They're supposed to be our idealists. The reason we want kids volunteering out in the world is to immunize them from these negative and toxic messages about teenagers. We want teenagers to be surrounded by thank yous rather than condemnation. That's what we want. And when your kid, become surrounded by those thank yous, that gratitude will 
really make them live up to a very high standard, and I believe it'll make a real big difference in their life. Now, when we're talking about contribution, I'm not talking about needing to send your child to Guatemala to build a small village. <laughs> All right? I'm really talking about going to the neighbor and helping her rake the leaves and shovel the snow. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you to be very, very local. And in fact, they might be the most important one. Next, coping. Here's the bottom line. We're going to spend about half an hour on coping tonight. The bottom line is that everything you fear in adolescence, whether it's drinking or drugs or cutting or eating disorders, or sex out of the context of a relationship, whatever you fear in teenagers, here's the fact. They're doing it to manage stress. And telling kids what not to do is not inspirational. Telling kids what not to do only shames them. Shame increases stress. Our challenge is to raise kids with a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies. To the extent that we can raise kids with a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies, they will do the right thing. We'll talk about that in depth later. The last thing is control. Because the bottom line is, the only way I'm going to make the right choices in life is if I really believe deeply that what I do matters. That, that I make a difference and the choices I make make a difference to the outcome. You either have an internal locus of control, which says what I do matters, or an external locus of control. Bullets are flying, that you're, you know, I have to live fast, die young. Or my choices make no difference. Where do kids learn a sense of control from? Where do you think? Home. It all is about discipline. All right? What does discipline mean, do you know? It means to teach. It doesn't mean to punish. It doesn't mean to control. When we discipline in such a way that kids learn the freedoms I get are directly related to what I have earned. The privileges that I receive are directly related to my safe and responsible behavior being demonstrated. When kids learn that, then they learn to feel large. They are in control of their behaviors. They are in control of their actions. The book that's recently released, which is Letting Go, is all about operationalizing uh, resilience. It's about uh, operationalizing control. It's about giving kids independence one step at a time. When you join with your child, and say, my, my goal is not to control you. My goal is to see that you are independent. And I'm going to give you more and more independence. All you need to do is to be safe and responsible. I'm going to break this task into small steps so that I will see you succeed at each step. And then I believe you're going to be able to do it on your own. When we honor kids' independence, they learn a sense of control. And furthermore, there's nothing that's more important for rebellion <coughs> prevention. Kids are going to rebel against parents who control them too tightly. Why? Because they need to fly from the nest. And if you, if you control them too tightly, then what they're going to do is they're going to push you away and they're going to rebel. When they know that you are on their side and that your goal is to support their independence, then what's going to happen is they're going to um, battle with you a little bit, but pretty much stick with you. And then and when they're about 20 or something, 22, they come back for the interdependence we really want. So if we really want a lifetime of good relationships, what we have to do is let kids go under our watchful eye, rather than hold them on too tight. Then they come back. This is the model of resilience. The rest of the talk is about one or more of these subjects. We're going to start with connection. I can't overstate how important connection is. All right, let's start with adolescence again. Why does it feel like so awful during adolescence? Why do they sometimes act like they completely hate us? And the answer is because they love how much they, uh, they hate how much they love you. Think about it. You're needing to fly from a nest. Do you want to fly from a nest that's all like warm and comfortable? No. If the nest is too comfortable, they're never going to want to leave. So they have to, in their minds, come up with a belief system that says that that nest is uninhabitable. <laughs> Strictly at best. So what happens is they hate how much they love you. And every time you try to draw a little bit closer, that just makes them hate you worse sometimes. And it's incredibly frustrating. Let's look at what's happening. Now let's imagine that every developmental milestone is a 10-foot chasm, right? It's a 10-foot chasm, and I've got to get to the other side. And it's 100 feet deep, and there are spikes coming up from the bottom. How do I, how do I jump? Or how do I get to the other side? 
Baby steps? No, big steps. Oh, big steps, okay. But even a big step, whoop, I fell down on bed. Okay, you could say also, you know, I love to build a bridge with my child to the other side. And the problem is that they're going to push you away, right? So what do I have to do to jump, right? And how do I jump? Do I jump like this? I do a running jump, which means I have to move backwards first. And then when I get to the edge, I cover my eyes to take a flying leap to get to the other side, right? We know this. We have lots of experience with this. Think about when your child was nine months old or 11 months old and she took her first step, right? And what's the exact next thing she did when she took her first step? What did she do that? She fell. And you went to pick her up, right? And what she wanted to go is, Mom, thank you so much. I have these new legs and ambulations, a brand new thing for me. I should appreciate the support. But what did she do instead? She screamed and she pushed you away. Now, remember also when she was two years old and she had those um, two-word sentences, but she had so much to say. She was such a smart little girl. Not smart like other mothers and fathers think their child is <laughs> Your child really had stuff to say. And so you finish, you finish her sentences for her, and she wants to say, Mom, thank you. You know, articulation's a new thing for me, so I sure do appreciate your support. But what does she say instead? Like, she pushes you away. She pushes you away and says, for me. Now, she's ready to go on her first date, and you decide to have the talk with her, right? So, you know, this is way, way, way too late, okay? Um, but you decide to have the talk, and what she wants to do is say, Mom, all right, Dad, thank you so much, because just last month, I thought you were the sexiest guy on the planet, and I thought I wanted to find a guy just like you. So I just can't imagine anybody I'd rather learn about sexuality from than you. What, what does she say instead? Ew! <laughs> All right? Now, who's had a kid go to college so far? That last summer, was it the most special summer of your life? <laughs> right? That's where you're going to have those mother-son dates, right? You're going to take him out, because I teach him everything I've ever taught him. Like, does he know not to play with matches? Does he know not to run with scissors? Yeah, because this is my chance. But you ask him for the date, and what does he say? And why can't he do it? Mom, I've got these friends. I've never really seen him again. And then he's ready to go to college, and he wants to leave, and he wants to, um, uh, what he wants to say is, Mom, Dad, you know, my goodness, you taught me so much, you know, you used to change me, you tutored me, you got me through all of these pressures. Do you think I'm ready for the academic and the social pressures? What about the sexual pressures? Can I call you or at least text you, I don't know, five, six, eight times a day? <laughs> well, what does he say instead? I'm so out of this prison. <laughs> Every, every major milestone in a kid's life is like moving backwards, taking a flying leap with their eyes closed. During adolescence, when they push you away, understand it's because of the intensity of the bond they have for you. And if you honor it, they will come back to you for the loving interdependence you want. Okay? So honestly, it's not like I don't have to say this to my kid, to myself sometimes. That two identical girls are the sweetest things on earth. Every once in a while, they don't act like they love me, and I just have to do some self-talk. I know that they really love me. <laughs> right. um, listening is the most important thing to maintain your connection during adolescence. You know, all the time, when parents come up to me and they're like, Dr. Penny, you know, what do I say? And the nice thing is I have only one standard answer, so I don't act like I know that much. And, and the answer is, you know, what do I say to this problem? But really, the standard answer is, it's not as important what you say. It's important that you listen and you're sounding important. But you know what? It's true. What you want is for your kids to keep talking. We're going to talk about that later. Which means you turn off your parents' alarm. Here's your parents' alarm. Mom, my friend Paul, I think he's doing drugs. This is a great opportunity to talk about drugs, to talk about feelings, why people use drugs, how to be supportive to a friend without being involved. But what are you going to say instead? He's from a very bad family, and I told you never to hang out with him again. <laughs> Mom, I met this girl. You're way too young to date! Right? That's what we do, is we shut people down with the parent alarm. Take a deep breath, say nothing, and don't catastrophize. Sometimes what we want to do when we're listening is we want to empathize. Molly, my friend Molly, she was really, really mean to me. She's a terrible child, Molly. Okay? We want to empathize, and we want to make them feel better. But all we do is we catastrophize. When you sit back and trust that they'll work through it, that you're there for them, 
but you don't, I know it's so hard. She's like, it's so hard. I know, I'm there, I'm there. <laughs> okay? But the point is, you have to look in the future, and you have to understand the extraordinary empathy. So I want to talk now, this might be the most important thing for this community. When I think about this community, I've driven around this community, I'm overwhelmingly impressed. It looks like a lovely place to live. But I also understand that there's quite a bit of pressure to succeed in, in all of America's affluent communities, but in this community as well. My fear is not that your kids are going to join gangs. Your kids aren't become, going to become gun toter drug addicts, drug dealers. My fear is that your kids are going to do what it takes to master stress in their lives. That's going to be drinking, that's going to be drugs, and that's going to be eating disorders. That's my fear. All of them, I think, are going to have a root in perfectionism. So in the next few minutes, just take a deep breath and bear with me as I talk about how to raise a kid who's not a perfectionist. Perfectionism, why are you trying to teach me not to have a kid who's a perfectionist? Perfectionists are great. They get into really good colleges. And when I was studying, when I was learning how to do my first interview, the first thing they said to me is that when someone says, what could you improve about yourself, Ken? You should say, well, I'm awfully hard on myself. I'm kind of a perfectionist, mm -hmm. right? That's what we were taught. Like it was a really good thing. It's not. It is the death of creativity and innovation. It is um, the death of feeling good about yourselves. And it interferes with people's ability to take constructive criticism. Let me, um, with all of those interfere with success. Let me build the case. So, the first thing is that a perfectionist, let me go back, of what is a perfectionist? There's two kinds of people. You want your kid to be a high achiever, you don't want them to be a perfectionist. They're both going to get straight A's, they're, or not, that's not true, they're both going to do well, um, not straight A's, they're going to both get into decent colleges, but the, if, I'm a, if I'm a concert pianist and I get a standing ovation, Everybody's incredibly overwhelmed with my concerto. As a high achiever, I feel blessed to be able to entertain people. How do I feel as a perfectionist? Stress. I could have done better. He didn't stand. What's wrong with me? He's the only one who really knows that I didn't do as well as I could have. I score, um, you know, uh, three uh, goals in soccer. My buddies take me out of their shoulders. The high achiever says what? Dude, what does the perfectionist say? I could have done it before. They, perfectionists do not like themselves. All right, so the first thing is they have self-loathing. The next thing they have is the fear of the B+. Plus. They are terrified. They see a B as something that will potentially destroy their life. All right, they see it as incredibly destructive. Number one, it will not. And number two is when you fear the B+, plus, you're not going to think outside the box. You know what, you're going to study for the test. You're not going to try to learn chemistry. You're going to say, what does Mr. Jones, what kind of questions does he ask? That's what you're going to think. You're going to study for a test, and when the test is over, you're not going to retain the information. You're going to write an essay, not an essay that challenges the dominant paradigm. You'd say you're going to write, write an essay that basically says, I wonder what, what she's really interested in, because I want this to really impress her. Now, think of little Tommy Edison. Classic example. Tommy Edison um, goes to his fifth grade teacher and he says, I'm going to create something that's going to change the world. I'm going to pick a filament. I'm going to force electrons through that filament and we're going to create resistance. I know you don't know what resistance is. I know you don't know what electrons is. But trust me, that resistance is going to translate into light. That light is going to be magnified because I'm going to surround it in glass. I'm going to change the world. Does he get an egg? Why not? It's like Tommy, we have candles, darling. Build a candle that doesn't drip. All right? The out-of-box thinking is exactly the best ideas that we've ever had. Perfectionists also fear the D word. We have a generation of kids who, more than anything else, are terrified of disappointing us. We don't beat our kids anymore. We just have sit-downs with them about how disappointed we are. And they cry as soon as our face, as soon as our, as our eyebrows begin going like this, they begin crying because of how incredibly scared they are of this um, When you cannot think outside the box, that's the death of creativity. Go back to the definition of success. Creativity um, and innovation are related to success. Perfectionism is the death. Perhaps most importantly, perfectionists resent constructive criticism. Feedback 
as something that is a personal attack. Why are you trying to take away my label from me? And they will fight. More, they, when a teacher gives them a B plus, they fight for the extra points to get the A rather than to learn the lesson that the teacher is trying to teach them. All right? It is the death of the ability to take back constructive feedback. Here are some of the things that begin creating the perfectionists and the lies that you want to make sure you don't allow kids in your community to live with. The first is kids, you know, you're going to be taking this test in 11th grade. It's called the SATs or the ACTs. I want you to know that this is going to determine your entire life and whether or not you're a success or a complete failure will depend on this day, which is why it's so important you keep your head together and relax when you take the test. <laughs> now, if you do really well on this test, then life will be handed to you on a silver platter. What part of that is a lie? All of it. There is no test that will determine your life and life is never handed to you on a silver platter. And therefore, if you are told to just put it off, just don't think about the present, just think about the future, then all that happens is you hate your education. Instead, all of work is hard, and because all of work is hard, that's exactly why you've got to enjoy every day as well. You don't put off the present. Here's lie number two. Kids, in order to um, get into a good school, you need to do really well in everything. You want to take five to six AP classes a year to show them how motivated you are. Now, if you're wondering whether you should get an A in an honors class or an A or a B in an AP class, the answer is clear. Take the AP class and get an A. <laughs> this is what we give kids. And kids, before you get a good college, you're going to want to take APs in everything because you want to show how well balanced you are. You also want to show your, that you're a team or a player. So it's very important that you're on a couple of teams. But I want them to understand you're a leader, so make sure you compete to become quarterback. All right? We also want them to know how compassionate you are. That's why, darling, we're buying you a ticket to Togo so you can build a water purification system in West Africa. All right? We, are, we raise kids to believe that they have to be good at absolutely everything. It's not possible. Is anyone in this room good at everything? No. Successful people are people who are really, really good at something, and what makes them interesting is that they still do other things that they may not be good at. That's true, and colleges know it. Colleges are looking for leaders. They're looking for people who are going to lead the world in the future. So it's better to let them really delve into something and know what their strengths and limitations are. So, um, let me... Well, let me do this now. So what that means is we have to accept that people are uneven, all right? And that means that your kid might not get straight A's. But what they, we want them to do is to look, take data. We want good effort from everybody in all classes. And now pay attention to that. Rather than saying, um, kids, just try your best, which is what we think we're doing when we're good parents, just try your best, ask your daughter what she hears when you say that. And what she hears is, you expect me to get all A's. Instead, talk about effort. We're going to talk about why in a few minutes. Talk about effort. Praise effort and expect good effort. I am not into mediocrity, guys. I'm a pen professor. I'm not into mediocrity, OK? The point is that I know that people are uneven. I am a very good doctor. I try to be a good teacher. I don't know anything about being a lawyer. I can't turn a screwdriver. I am completely inept with inanimate objects, but I can work with gang members and other people really easily. If it's a human, I can work with it, all right? But I'm the most uneven guy in the world, right? That's how people are. So you take a test, or excuse me, you work really hard at a subject, and if you get absolute A's and it comes really easily to you and you're just going for the grade but it's not particularly interesting but the subject comes really easy, congratulations. That's not your job. You will get bored in a year. Okay? Something that comes easily, not your job. But if you have to work really, really hard and you struggle a little bit but the struggle is so worth it because you keep getting better and better and you find it really interesting and you see your intelligence grow, that's your job. And if you work really, really hard at something, and you're not able to get good grades, you're only pulling off seats, but you find it absolutely fascinating and you wish you could be better, that's your hobby. And if you work really, really hard at something and you're getting terrible grades and you hate it, forget about it. 
Just know enough so that when someone comes to you at a cocktail party and says, I'm a, I'm a biochemical engineer, you'll sort of know what that is. Okay? <laughs> Just know enough to be able to have a intelligent conversation about it. That's what we, we have to let kids feel like they're allowed to be uneven. That's the way to foster real success. Where does perfectionism come from? It comes from these lies that we allow kids to learn. And it comes also, I mean, if you are the kind of parent who says, there will be no bees in this house, it's unacceptable, you'll be out in the street if you ever get a bee, then it's just possible you're part of the problem. Okay? <laughs> but my sense of it is this. There are very, very few villains in parenting. There is no one who's doing something with an effort to hurt their kids. All right? Sometimes um, we could be part of the problem, but we are always part of the solution because there are many, many forces that are coming together to create this phenomenon. First, we live in a toxic society. America has a sense of who is successful completely backwards. Who are our heroes in America? It's our rap stars, it's the reality stars, it's the people who are making $40 million a year who are wearing pants that are too tight and throwing the ball. I don't get it. Okay? That's who our heroes are. Think about, um, uh, think about the, um, well, who should our heroes be? Teachers. Teachers absolutely should be our number one heroes. Here are our, probably some of our brightest people in society taking a major salary cut because we live in a society that says, if children is part of your resume, you make a fraction of what other people make. That's true if you're a social worker, it's true if you're a counselor, it's true if you're a doctor. I make a fraction of what my brother makes who's not a because I put children on my resume. So from my point of view, I'm a hero. A <laughs> <laughs> hero is a person who stays home to take care of his mother with Alzheimer's disease. That's a hero. A hero is a fireman who runs into a building to help other people when I would be so running out. A hero is a marine, an a, a, a soldier, a seaman, someone who's willing to sacrifice for other people. Those are heroes. And when we have conversations about these kind of heroes, then kids learn, I could be that kind of hero too. Because the current heroes that we have, we do something to all of them. First, who can name a um, Olympic person from uh, the 2008 Olympics? A bronze medalist. Can you name someone? Bronze medalist? You can't. Because if you get a bronze medal in America, then what happens is the commentator comes up to you and says, are you very disappointed in your performance? I bet the people in your hometown must be very, very disappointed in your failure. Right? Third best in the world, guys! <laughs> Third best in the world! And we call them failure. And then if you do get eight gold medals and get caught on YouTube smoking weed, then what happens to you? Destroy. We live in a society where we build up heroes and then we destroy them. We want kids not to feel so vulnerable. We make our heroes our neighbors who are taking care of their relatives. We make our heroes our teachers and our social workers. And we make it so that every kid can be a hero. What's another source of perfectionism? Is the desire to spare us. If you're an immigrant family, you've been through difficult times, then your kids might just grow up to be perfect little girls and boys because you've been through so much you sacrifice so much that they don't want to bring home any problems to you. Okay? Um, if uh, you've gotten a divorce, if you survive cancer, don't be surprised if your kids want to be perfect little girls and boys. We have to have a conversation with these kids, which is don't spare me. So the conversation in a divorced family or a divorced parent needs to say is, yeah, you know, your mom and I got divorced and it was a very hard time. Maybe I didn't protect you from knowing how stressed out I was. But let me tell you the one thing that your mom and I absolutely agree on, and that's how emphatically we love you. And the most important thing to me still is being a good dad to you. And I see you trying to protect me and to take care of me. That's not your job. Your job is to let me feel good about myself. And the way that I'm going to feel good about myself is by being your dad. And when you protect me from the ability to do that, you're not sparing me. That's the conversation we need to have. Otherwise, we're going to produce these perfect little girls and perfect little boys. Final point, and probably the most important point. This is borrowing from the work of uh, Carol Dweck, who is a wonderful person, wonderful researcher who wrote the book Mindset, which I recommend very emphatically. 
It's summarized in my books, but if you want to go to the source, you go to her book. Here is what she discovered. She discovered that authentic success is largely related to how we praise kids. So, and it's related to the self-esteem movement and all of that stuff. So what happens? She did some research starting many years ago, like 20 years ago, where she took fifth graders and she gave them the last part of IQ tests, all the visual manual stuff, the puzzles and the mazes, and she divides them into two groups, randomly, so they're similar groups. She takes kids individually in rooms. One group of kids, she says, you did very well on this test. You're very smart. The other group of kids, she says, you did really well on this. You put in a really good effort. Then, the next thing she does is she gives kids another test. Or she offers them another test. Would you like to take some more of these puzzles? What do the kids who are praised for being smart do? No, no, thank you. I do really well. Thank you. I'm done. But what about the kids who were praised for effort? Yes, please, give me some more. All right. She then goes and she gives them a test that is an eighth grade test. So it's three years above them. What happens to the kids who are praised for being intelligent? They fall apart, especially the girls have massive anxiety. What happens to the people who are praised for effort? They just keep turning it around, thinking, I can figure this out. I just haven't put in enough effort. The next morning, she gives them another test. It's a fifth grade test. Exactly their level, exactly it. They should perform it the same way they did the first time. What happens to the kids who are praised for intelligence? Down 20%. So anyone tells you that IQ tests are standard? No, it doesn't understand people. Down 20%. Um, what happens to people who are praised for effort? <coughs> Up 30%. Is that phenomenal? That was the entire intervention. The entire intervention is, you're so smart versus, I really appreciate your effort. She then goes and she does research where she looks at people and she looks backward at how they were parented to try to get a sense of whether mostly they were praised for their intelligence, whether praise was lavished on them, uh, or whether they were praised for a hard work ethic. And here's what she discovers. The people who are praised for intelligence develop what's called, she calls a fixed mindset, and that I call perfectionism. They're pretty similar. People with a fixed mindset, people who are always praised for being smart or for the product that they produce. They didn't like hard work. You know why they didn't like hard work? Because they saw hard work as a sign that they weren't naturally intelligent. If you give them a challenge that is outside of where they have labeled themselves as intelligent, I'm smart in math, and then you say, let's try history, they're like, oh no, thank you. I don't want to lose the label. They look for life partners who make them feel good about themselves all the time. They look for people who are going to flatter them. They do not take constructive criticism. They see constructive criticism as an attack because they have such deep-rooted imposter syndrome, this is Ginsburg talking not to act. okay, they have such deep-rooted uh, imposter syndrome within them that they see constructive criticism as an attack. This person knows, she knows she's getting really close to understanding that how stupid I really am inside. And so they see it and they get really defensive. People who are praised for effort or process, like hard work, they see it as an opportunity to Wrong. They um, like to think outside the box, and if they're really good at history, and you say, let's talk about math, they're like, yeah, let me see if I can learn that too. It's worth the effort. They look for lovers and people who compliment them, people who are different than them, and therefore who will challenge them. And they look at constructive criticism as um, something that's going to help them grow. Let's put this all together. The definition of success to be happy, to be compassionate, generous, and uh, um, to have empathy, to be, have social and emotional intelligence. Well, where do you learn that? You learn that on the playground. You learn that in recess. You learn that in collaborative programming, not in races to the top. Constructive criticism, people who can take constructive <coughs> criticism. We are destroying it when we pressure kids and we focus only on their grades and think they're not good enough or less. We are actually undercutting their ability to set and succeed, and we are putting into place those perfections and characteristics that will also undercut their um, creativity and innovation. That is why.
dialing down the pressure, looking at kids as individual and seeing what really makes them thrive and what really makes them heart sing, heart sing will actually make them more successful. Why do I speak to communities? I speak to international audiences, I speak to like large, large um, uh, forums. Why do I love communities more than anything? You guys can make a decision about what to do. We're sitting here in a school. You can lead efforts to dial down the competition, to dial down the pressure, under the belief that ultimately your kids will do better. But the only way you're possibly going to do it is if you get off this treadmill together. Because you know what? It's really, really hard to drive around with a bumper sticker that doesn't say your kid's gone to a top college in a community like this. Which means you have to get off the, the treadmill together and say, what is authentic success? And will there be people in your community who will applaud you and say, yes, you get your child off the treadmill. That's one more spot for me at Harvard. <laughs> yes. Yes. That will happen. And it's a struggle. And I'm, I'm following my advice and I'm struggling with it because I know my kids aren't going to go to Harvard. They're not going to even go to Penn, which would be really beneficial to me in terms, in terms of the pocketbook, how much I would save. All right? But you know what? I want to find the right match for my kids. I want them to be successful 35-year-olds. And what I would have to do now to get them to go into Penn would actually undercut their long-term success. I know that. Do I get scared? Do I worry? Everybody in my family has always go to Penn. I'm fourth generation in Penn. Okay? Um, third. But still, for a Jew, that's amazing. <laughs> so, um, so the point is, my kids will not be fourth generation, but because it's not right for them, I'm trying to raise them to be authentically successful. I want to make one other point. I think this is a really hard community to grow up in. I haven't spent much time here, but I've driven around, and it, it's gorgeous, okay? And I know that kids feel like they're under a lot of pressure to maintain this standard of living. And let me tell you something. I know that I keep talking about straight A's, and I know that not every one of your kids is the top kid in the class. And I know that there are B and C students in this class, and I want all of them to feel immensely successful when they graduate. Every kid should succeed and find their niche in society. Not everyone's going to Stanford or Northwestern or Penn or Harvard. Some people are going to become excellent construction workers. Some people are going to join the military and serve the country. That's wonderful. But I also want you to understand that some of your lazy children, some of your unmotivated children, are anything but. It is very hard to be lazy and to be someone's child who comes to a parenting talk to hear a funny looking little man talking to you for two hours. I doubt your children are lazy. I bet that quite a few of them are pretending they are. Okay? I was one of these kids. Alright? So if it's not immensely obvious to you, I'm like a classic ADD kid boy energy all the way. The world is my oyster as long as there are people in front of me, and as long as I can move, I'm great. If I stop moving, like you want to see what scares me to death? This is hard to me. Okay? If I was standing behind this, I would lose my ability to talk. My brain doesn't work standing still. All right? That's who I am. I'm a little fifth grade boy with immense boy energy. I also scored immensely high, or very high on IQ test. My grades, any class that you could get, that you could talk in or write a paper, I was getting A's and A pluses. Anything that involved homework whatsoever, I was getting C's, D's, and F's. I was your classic discordant kid. I was raised in a house that believed in an enormous amount of flexibility in terms of what I could do with the future. It was very clear to me that I was allowed to be any kind of doctor I wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, my grades, I'm getting C's, D's, and F's in high school, I'm supposed to be gifted, blah, 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 and ten times a day, I heard, Ken, you're not living up to your potential. Ten times a day. What did I do? I got off the plate. You know, I still did all my social justice practices, but I did just 
what it would take. Just dressed a little bit differently, did some slightly naughty behaviors that I would disclose but not on camera, and <laughs> um, just enough slightly naughty behaviors so that people would go, Ken, yeah, he's a great guy, really into social justice, really cares, really good friend to people. He just doesn't care. That's why he does X, Y, and Z. Was any of that true? It was a facade. It was a lie because it was too hard to grow up in my family and to be able to not be able to learn the way other people were learning. It was too difficult. And it was too difficult at that time for me to go to my parents and say, I don't know what's going on, but I can't focus and I'm getting really nervous. So, but it was really easy to go, here's a crap, that's lame. Really easy, because that's cool. So I do not believe that any of your kids are going to be lazy or unmotivated. I want you to look for the kids in your community who are doing drugs. Those are some of your best kids. Those are your highly sensitive kids who are choosing to become numb because they're, because they're so stressed out, but they have sensitivity. There's so many different ways of dealing with stress. Those kids who are using drugs, those are the kids who care too much and who are choosing to become numb. Don't write them off. Understand what it's like to get B's and C's in this community. Understand what it's like to be below average in a community that's in the top 5% of America. That's who your kids are. And you've got to lift all of them up together. And you can do it when you change your philosophy of believing that every kid can succeed and that human beings are uneven. And what my job is, is to help my child find out what makes their heart sing so they can make a major, major contribution to the niche in the world that they belong in. Right? All right, so I want to move on to, whoa, we're running out of time. Not out of time, but we're just not going as fast as we want. Um, so now, let's uh, go on to some other subjects. Let's skip this. Um, I want to talk now about giving kids some confidence by building social skills in you know, this is where um, How are we going to talk to kids? How are we going to talk to kids? We have to talk to kids in a way that they can understand. All right? We all the time are communicating with kids in ways that we understand, which makes them rebel and makes them feel incompetent. Let's first think about how it is that kids think. I'm five years old. How do I think? Concretely. What is concrete thought? What is concrete? It's a block of rock. You, you chop it in half. What is it? Two blocks of rock. It's not very complicated. That's what concrete thought is. When I'm a concrete thinker as a five-year-old, do I think about future consequences of current behaviors? No. No. Do I, you know, if you hand me a dollar fifty and you say, Ken, you can get an ice cream sandwich. Well, you know, if you invest in a 529 plan now, <laughs> okay, I do not think about future consequences of current behaviors. I can't. All right? And um, how do I view people? Are people, like, um, very complicated as a five-year-old? People are good or bad. And how do I decide if you're good or bad? If they smile at you or whether or not they give me a cookie. You know, you've got about a thousand cookies out there. Come give them to me. And I'll say, is that cookie for me, me, me? You know? And um, that's so, do you see how dangerous it is to be a child? You don't think about future consequences of current behaviors. You don't understand the complexity of human nature. So it's pretty dangerous. What do we do, therefore? We watch our children really closely. Now I'm walking through adolescence. Are you watching me as closely? Nope, you should watch me closer than that, but you're not. All right? Now, I'm an adult. Very same height, but I'm an adult now. <laughs> and, and now I am an abstract thinker, meaning I understand nuance, meaning I understand what happens, that what I do now uh, will affect me in the future. You can talk to me now about emphysema. You can talk to me about lung cancer. I get it. I can think into, adult, uh, into later adulthood. How do I view people? If someone comes and hands me a cookie, am I convinced they're nice? No. Suppose someone noticed really how exquisite I am. And they take me out to dinner, right? That's true. And they take me out to dinner. <laughs> and they're really, really nice, and they're really flattering, and they say the nicest things during dinner, and have me buy the most expensive stuff on the menu, and then they um, take me out and suggest that I buy a new pair of shoes and a new sweater, and then as we're strolling, they ask to touch a little cat. What do I say? <laughs> So, um, so when I just give you the benefit of the doubt now, I say no. What do I understand about their generosity and their flattery? 
that there is a price, that there is a faith, that, that there is a motivation behind it. Furthermore, so I understand the complexity of human behavior, I understand people's underlying motivation, and I understand that what I'm doing now is going to affect my future, right? And that's highly protective to me. That is an abstract thought. The first thing you need to know is that not everyone reaches abstract thought, all right? 15% uh, of people never get there to relate to intelligence, and all people in crisis go concrete. So if you talk to someone abstractly, when they're upset, they don't understand a word you're saying. When you also talk to someone abstractly, when they're below about 15, they're not going to understand what you're saying. Because you only get abstract thought, meaning nuances, meaning understanding complexity of human nature. You only get it when you're about 14 and 15. So how did I get here towards being an abstract thinker? Two things occurred. The first thing that occurred is I reached purity, and therefore my brain began changing as well. And the balance between my emotional centers and my thinking centers, all of that changed, and I can absorb abstract thought. What else happened that made me walk towards the safety of adulthood? The safety of adulthood, where I'm going to understand future consequences, and I'm going to understand complexity. What else happened? I have experiences. I'm a 14-year-old girl, and a guy comes up to me and says, I love you. Do I say, I question the truthfulness of that statement? <laughs> what do I say? Oh. And then what does the guy say? Words? They're not good enough between us. I want to show you how much I love you. And where is he the next day? So gone. All right? And she has moved from here to here towards the safety of the dog. And she will continue to make a variety of life mistakes. And with each life mistake, she will become wiser and wiser and wiser. Right? Now, if I was a learning theorist, and we are sitting in a school today, if I was a learning theorist, I would say this is perfect. We don't even want to consider messing with this because there's no better way to learn than through a mistake. But I'm a daddy. <laughs> I'm a daddy, and I have two 16-year-old girls. Do I want my girls to learn by mistake? No. So what do I do? I tell them. And how do I tell them? I tell them by, by lecturing them. All right? Now, here's the lecture. Because I understand the wisdom. I understand the experience. Now, listen to me. Don't you know that what you're doing right now, which I'm going to call behavior A, could easily lead to consequence B? That worries me sick. I didn't have to worry about like this with you because you used to seem like you had better judgment. But now it feels like you just got cobwebs between your ears. And, you know, and, and if, if, behavior, if you do behavior B, I see more than likely you're going to go to, go to consequence C. If you have consequence C happens, I could easily see that leading to consequence D. I used to not worry about this, but you know what? Now you're hanging out with Tony, and he's a bad influence. I'm telling you, I don't think his parents even love him. Now, if consequence D happens, you're going to go into consequence E, which can lead directly to consequence F. Now, if consequence F happens, look at me when I'm talking to you. I'm not talking for my own good. I want you to pay attention to me and take that smirk off your face. If consequence F happens, then I can see you easily going on a consequence G. If consequence G happens, that's going to lead directly to consequence H, which God forbid would go on to consequence I. Do you know what happens if consequence I happens? This is not for my good, it's for you. You listen to me, you die is what happens. And what does the kid hear? Blah, blah, blah. Womp, womp, womp. Die! <laughs> they understand your condescension, they understand your anger, but they do not understand the content of what you're saying at all. All right? Why? Because the lecture is abstract. It's algebraic in cadence. Listen again. I'm going to put forth a variety of variables. We're going to look at how they interact and see how that creates a different outcome. That's algebra. You can't <coughs> excuse me, teach algebra to someone who's running from a tiger, and you can't teach algebra to someone who is 13 years old. Therefore, we have to change the mathematical cadence of how we are talking. All right, and we have to change it to simple math, which goes like this. Huh, I hear that you're thinking about doing behavior A. Sometimes I worry about that because that could go on to consequence B. Do you have any plans to make sure that doesn't happen? Tell me about those plans, because I'll feel a lot better when I know you've thought this through. Well, if you haven't thought about it, have you ever seen it happen on TV? How do people handle it there? Or how do your friends handle it? And you put forth a variety of leading questions that you're going to have the kid answer so that they get it 
they get it, and then they got it. And when they own it, and then when they do one step at a time, who owns the solution? They do. When they own the solution, they don't need to rebel. Do you get it? It's really a magnificent way of communication. Um, in the book, there are several different categories of ways in which we're going to produce what I call cognitive aha experiences, which is I'm going to facilitate a kid to get it, get it, get it, got it. Where there's just really like you can actually see their nose flare. It's like an I got it kind of experience. It is major rebellion prevention. Let me give you one example, which is the same one I used this morning, but the simplest one. Bill Cosby. Um, do you remember when um, in the original Bill Cosby show, do you remember when Theo gets a D on a test? <coughs> All right. So can you imagine the lecture? You're getting a D. Well, what kind of job are you going to get? You're going to be homeless and then you're going to die. All right. Here's what Bill says. Huh, you got a D. Well, no, the first thing he says is, you got a D. How are you going to get to a good college? How are you going to get to Hillman? And Theo says, Dad, don't worry about me. What do you mean I shouldn't worry about you? I'm not going to college. Can you imagine the lecture now? <laughs> Seriously, can you imagine the lecture? But Bill's really smart. And he says, huh, you're not going to college. Well, how are you going to handle this? You know, I'm going to get some sort of a job. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, he said, what are you going to do then? The first thing Theo says is, I'm going to be a regular person. Yeah, well, um, what do regular people do? You know, get a job. Well, do you know anyone your age who's gotten a job? You know, are, you, are you seeing the choreography? This is a choreographed conversation. Bill knows exactly where he's going, exactly. He's mapped it out in his mind. But rather than delivering in a lecture format, he is stringing his kid along so that his kid gets each step along the way and can own the solution. That's what Bill's choreographing. Huh, well what do, uh, uh, you're going to be a regular person. What do regular people do? Get a job. Would you know anyone your age who's got a job? Yeah, there's this friend of mine and he works at a gas station. Well, how much does he make? $8 an hour. $8 an hour? That's a lot of money. That's what I was thinking. Well, how much is that a month? That's $1,200 a month. Well, you know what? I'll give you $1,500. And he hands up $1,500 of monopoly money. Theo begins counting the money, gets all excited. And Bill says, oh, you know what, Theo? The tax man comes to regular people first. And he takes a chunk of money. Then he says, Theo, where are you going to live? Because I just want to make sure you know something. You're not living here. And Theo said, I'm going to give myself a bachelor pad. Nice, where were you thinking about? I don't know. I think there's some nice ones up at Upper West Side. There sure are. And he takes all the money. And Theo says, I'll live in Jersey. And he takes the money back. Bill says, well, then you're going to need, um, need a car. And he takes car, gas money, toll money, um, all going out of Theo's hands. And then um, he says, Theo, you know, it seems pretty important to you that you look good. And Theo says, Dad, I don't care what I look like. The ladies care what I look like. <laughs> Bill takes um, $100. He said, that costs you. He takes $100. And Theo says, Dad, I would look really good. And hands him another $100. <laughs> and he says, Dad, this is a great lesson. I'm, I'm looking good. I'm feeling good. This is really wonderful. And Bill says, well, there's just one problem, Theo. You haven't eaten yet, Theo. And he takes some all the money. And Theo says, I'll eat bologna and peanut butter. And, uh, and uh, then he's got about $40 left. Does anyone remember? And he's counting and he's saying, Dad, this is a great lesson. I have everything I want. I've got my car. I'm eating. I'm not wasting my time in school. Do you remember with you what Bill says? You're going to have a girlfriend? And Theo goes, oh, yeah. And Bill goes, Doop! <laughs> That is genius, genius parent. Uh, I want to talk quickly about some other competencies that we can develop in kids, uh, most importantly being social skills. There are a variety of different social skills that I teach that I think are important for you to know. I'm only going to give you one. What we wish is that kids had the ability to say to their friends, I'm sorry, but I am morally, ethically, and spiritually opposed to your behavior. I shall not participate. Are you going to see this happening? Very, very hard. What do kids want to be more than anything else? They want to be normal, and they want to fit in. They don't want to be seen as making decisions that are against their friends. But you know what they're happy to say? My mother, she's such a bitch. <laughs> so, one of the things that we have to give them is the ability to navigate your culture. And just one of the skills I'm going to share tonight is the ability of basically having them say, just, you know, just blame me, right? This is what my mother taught me, all Jewish mothers taught me. Tell them no, tell them your mother said no. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> there's a couple of categories here. Who has kids who are like five years old or younger? Right? Just shout out to me some of the things you do to put them to bed. You read, sing, tuck them in. Leave on the light. Leave on the light. Prayer, maybe. Bath, maybe. Who has teenagers? Yeah, did you give them a bath? <laughs> right? So what happens is we have these bedtime rituals that are special time with our kids, but that we completely have stopped with our teenagers. All right? And let me tell you something. When I'm coming in at midnight, or when a friend is handing me a bomb, and I'm deciding whether or not I can get away with it, imagine how powerful it would be if I really didn't want to do it, and if I could say to my friend, are you kidding? She smells me. We have to have a check-in rule with our kids. We should never allow any kid to go to bed without sitting down on our bed and having a conversation with us. Even if it's two in the morning, you shouldn't be sleeping too tightly anyway. Kids are out, it's two in the morning, they come home, you talk. That allows them to turn around and go, are you kidding? Do you know what I have to go home to? It's really protective. The final point is code work. Of everything I've ever written, this is the most effective and the thing I get the most emails or letters about saying, you've saved my child's life. Again, in our dreams, our kids would say, I am morally, ethically, and spiritually opposed to this behavior. In reality, I'm out drinking with five or six guys. I've signed Mothers Against Drunk Driving contract, meaning I understand that I shouldn't be driving when I'm drunk. I shouldn't be in another car when other people are drunk. I will call my mother. She will pick me up. She will reward me for making this good decision. Do you like that? I like it. I like it a lot. Okay? I'm with my buddies now, and I say, guys, I'm sorry, but you're misbehaving, and I promised my mom that if ever, things ever get out of hand, I'm calling her. It's really hard to do, right? But now, let's, uh, let's make code work. First thing, give me first. Aren't you still working your houses? Sometimes, sometimes, I can imagine that being hard to work in a conversation. You could say, sure, looking forward to coming over for that. Juice, mom. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, so I'm over at Ryan's house. We're hanging out. There's five or six people around. I'm like, what time do you guys want to get home? Midnight? Let's stay up till one. Let's do that. Watch this. Right. Mom. Okay. Ryan's. Good. All right. Trigonometry. No, not fun at all. Seriously, trigonometry. Yeah, no, I'm not going to be home until uh, 2 in the morning, probably. Yeah, don't even wait up for me. Um, no, I didn't get a chance to walk spotty. Um, yeah, just let him out, and then when I get home, I promise to walk around the block, or take him for a really long walk in the morning, I promise. What was the code? Yeah, to which my mom is replying on the other line, my boy a lot, he's in serious trouble. <laughs> and what does she do? She yells. And if I can get it home on my own, then I just uh, hang up the phone and I go, my mom's such a pain in the butt, right? But if I can't get home, what do I do? I yell back, don't tell me what to do. I'm 16 years old, don't tell me I have to come home. You're not gonna be able to control me all year. And then what does my mother say? Where are you? I'm coming to get you. And she comes and she picks you up. Code word. It's a very, very important social skill that can really help you save a child. When we're talking about control, I want to talk now about discipline a bit. We're not going to go over the whole discipline model tonight, but I want to talk about discipline a bit. Kids either believe that the world happens to me or that they believe that I control my destiny. What's going to make them believe it is all about how they are disciplined. When they are disciplined to know that the freedoms that they get are directly related to the responsibilities that they demonstrate, they will learn to that they control their actions. The question for us as parents is how much control should we have? So this is one of those things. You know how I began the talk by saying, my God, this is frustrating for me. I struggle. I don't really know. You know, which is all true. This is the area that I'm actually dogmatic about because we know the answer. There is more research on how much parents should control kids than anything else. Research that really looks at outcomes of behavior. When we talk about parenting style, we are talking about two forces. One force is love and warmth and support, and the other force is control. Kids need 
both. If you look at these two phenomena, there are four sets of parents. There are parents who are very high in control and very low in warmth. These are called authoritarian parents. These are, you do what I say, why? Because I, because said, I so. said so. How do these kids turn out? These kids are very, very good kids. These kids don't do drugs until they do so many drugs you can't imagine. These kids don't do have sex until they begin having sex, and when they do, they do not protect themselves with condoms, and they have higher rates of STDs, and they do not go and talk to their parents about it. Okay? So they're very good until they stop being good. Um, women raised with authoritarian um, fathers often look for controlling husbands, which is certainly not what you're looking for in your daughter's spouse. Okay? We have many of us were raised this way. It felt awful. It felt so awful that we became very, very nice. Very, very high on the warmth, very low on the control. This is, um, darling, I love you. I really enjoy spending time with you. Um, the sun rises when you get up and sets when you get down. You're really the center of my life. Dr. Ken, I don't need to leave the room. I will if you ask me to, but my daughter, she's like my best friend. We talk about everything. No, darling, I do. I trust you so much. Go ahead. Do what you want. You're going to do the right thing. How do these kids turn out? These, this is called permissive or indulgent parenting. How do these kids turn out? Very, very sweet, neurotic as hell. These are the kids who are terribly, terribly afraid of disappointing their parents. All right? Uh, in terms of risk behaviors, they're pretty high in the risk behavior category, and they do not tell their parents. Parents think they know what's going on, but they don't, all right? But they believe that they have implicit permission to do these negative behaviors. The worst kind of parenting, which none of you are by definition because you're here, is the disengaged parent. That's the, um, do what you want, kids will be kids, you'll figure it out on your own. And the only time you get really involved is when the barn is on fire. So what do these kids do? They set the bar on fire. <laughs> Because what kids want more than anything else is attention. So they will do what it takes, and they will set the bar on fire. OK, so these are delinquent kids. The kind of parenting that has been shown to be effective to reduce drug use, increase school engagement, decrease car crashes in half, that's my own research, um, a delay of sexual initiation um, is your balanced parenting, your, par your authoritative parenting. Darling, I love you. I trust you, I'm going to spend really good time with you, and I really enjoy that time. I'm going to give you deep <laughs> roots so that you're going to have a sense of what my values are, but I'm also going to give you wings so that you're going to know how to fly on your own. I'm going to allow you to make some errors, okay? And I'm not going to make rules about a lot of things. But when I do make rules about things, and those are going to be about safety, you will do as I say. That's balanced parenting. Those kids do extraordinarily well across every parameter of behavior. The next question you have to ask yourself is, all right, Ken, you're talking about control. Well, I know that the most important thing about control is monitoring. And here's where the research has just really blossomed in the last five or six years, all right? Because five or six years ago, if you were talking about monitoring, all that we were talking about was um, making sure you knew where your kids were, who they were with, when they were going to go come home, and what they were doing. Who, what, where, when, how. All right? And that's what was on all the websites. That's what all the TV commercials were saying. You're a parent, you've got to know who, what, when, where, how. Turns out that that doesn't really matter that much. You should still ask so that they know you're paying attention. Why do you think it doesn't matter that much in terms of effective monitoring? They lie. Kids absolutely lie. So the really important thing is not what you ask, it's what they tell you. So the question is, do we know how to raise kids so that they're more likely to disclose? And yes, we do. Step one is be an authoritative parent. Have clear rules, clear love, clear warmth, and be responsive to their needs. Do that, and kids will tell you what's going on. Next, um, we know that um, well, Judith Smetana, a researcher out of Rochester, what she did is she looked at what, how kids view uh, parental control. And kids divide things into three categories. Things are about safety, things are my personal business, 
or things are um, uh, about you know dealing with society, like make sure that you pay attention on the road, don't pick your nose in public, and things like that. From kids' point of view, you are not only allowed to, but it is your obligation to protect them and teach them about safety. You are allowed to teach them about societal rules, but do not get close to anything personal. So, it's a matter of how we frame things. When we say things to kids, like, I don't want you hanging out with, with Bill, he's trouble, then the answer is, why do you hate Bill? Why do you hate all my friends? Why do you think you tell me what to do? But if we frame it very clearly about safety, so the classic example, or the perfect example, I think, is driving. We know that having peer passengers in cars increases crash risk. Three peer passengers in a car quadruples the crash risk. Only one doubles it. We know that. If you say to kids, I'm sorry for the first year you're driving, you can't have any friends in your car. What they hear is, why are you always trying to control me? What do you have against my friends? Why are you ruining my life? If you say, darling, I love your friends a lot, and I want you all to live, and we know that we, there's a lot of new research that says that having another kid in the car makes you more likely to crash. I want you to be with your friends, something you guys are going to go, while you're getting more and more practice. But until you get your reflexes down, no friends in your car. Love you too much, it's about safety. They will listen to that message. The next thing is uh, we want to talk to kids, turn off the parents' alarm, and become very effective listeners. All right? Become very effective listeners. Because when you're a listener, kids talk. Final point, we want our kids to fight. Who has sons, raise your hand. Who has daughters, raise your hand. All right, the people who have sons have a little bit of an easier adolescent in general. Because what they are is they become, the way they rebel is they become exhausted. Sorry, I'd really love to talk to you, but it's just rude. <laughs> and they, also, they also become deaf. What? <laughs> right. So they rebel, but they well, they rebel by withdrawing, but they also don't tell you what's going on in their lives. The girls fight. They come to your neck, they grab it, they shake it, and they fight, and that's a great thing. Because you know what's going on in their lives. So what you do is you want your kids to continue fighting, but you want to make sure you let them win. Because if you do not let them win when they fight sometimes, then they will stop talking. So if you are authoritarian, when your girl comes up and says, I think I should be able to stay out late, and let me give you five to six reasons that feel perfectly reasonable to me why I've earned the right to stay out late. If you're an authoritarian parent, you say, I'm sorry, the rules are the rules, and, and there's no discussion. Then your kid, in turn, learns not to tell you. They sneak out the window. They don't have to tell you. If instead you say, you know you made a really reasonable argument, you did finish all your homework, you have been incredibly responsible, and you did help me take the room last weekend. Absolutely. Stay out like to have a, have a good night tonight. And that kid learns, see, when I tell my parent what's going on, sometimes they're fair. I still hate them, but sometimes <laughs> they're fair. And then they continue fighting, and you know what's going on. Does that make sense? Okay, quick check-in. We started about 20 minutes later than we were supposed to, which means may I go seven to eight minutes after nine? Yes. Okay. Because otherwise I was going to be so rushed in this last topic. I was going to be really nervous. So, all right. So we're going to skip this for now. Again, this is, this is about how to discipline effectively. It's very, very much in the book. But what I want to do is I want to talk about um, the most important thing for you to walk away with which is stress. At its core, resilience is about being able to cope in a positive way with life's inevitable stresses. And I believe that we're going to do our greatest good as parents when we raise kids with a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies. Um, here's the model. Life is incredibly stressful. It's so stressful that it can make you feel incredibly uncomfortable. And you have to be able to cope with that discomfort. And there are different ways of coping. There are positive ways, and there are negative ways. And I don't have markers. OK? Um, there are positive ways, and there are negative ways of coping uh, with stress. And when I say positive, that doesn't mean that that works, and the negative ways don't work. Quite to the contrary. The negative ways of coping work magnificently, really, really well. These are your easy, quick fixes. 
You want to see my pain? It's not that I've been abused. It's not that I have no sense of control in my life. You want to see my pain? There's my pain, Dr. Ken. I'm in charge of when, where, and how I feel. You know, my life's completely out of control, but at least I stop thinking for a few minutes. Everything that we fear works really well. And what we can do is we can wrap our head around those negative coping strategies and we can say, stop it, don't do that. That's counterproductive. But do you understand that if you do that, then kids, thank you so much, then kids will feel ashamed. Instead, we need to understand that the reason that the things that are negative are in the negative category is because they lead to more stress. But what we really have to do is invite kids to consider a wide record for a positive coping strategy so that the path of least resistance is right there. If you can make it so that you know your kid has a path of least resistance there because their box of positive coping strategies is so full, it will ultimately lead to relief. So what does it look like? When I was designing a stress reduction plan, I explored the literature for a year to see what works with kids and with adults. And here's how things are broken down. There are two broad categories of dealing with stress. The first is engagement, taking stuff on. And the second is disengagement. I feel very uncomfortable with this. I'd rather not do it. Who's healthier, the people engaged or the people disengaged? Clearly engagers. But that's because when you think about disengagement, you're thinking about someone who's gaming all night, someone who's running away, someone who's um, drinking. But you know what? People who read books are also disengaging. People who are working their hobbies are disengaging. Taking walks are disengaging. People who are doing yoga are disengaging. There are healthy ways to disengage. Within engagement, there are two broad categories. There's dealing with the problem. But if you only know how to deal with the problem, then you're not learning how wonderful it is to reach out to other human beings and to look for support. But if you only know how to deal with the emotions and reach out to other human beings to look for support, then you know what? The problem's still there and it's going to bite you in the ass. It's still there. So what you need to do is raise kids to have a wide variety of engagement strategies that know how to deal with emotions and reach out to other human beings, but they also know how to deal with problems so that they're not there to bite them later. And you need kids who can get away from it all. I don't want my whole life to be thinking about managing stress. I'm doing art, why I feel good. Sometimes I just want to get away from it all. This is a stress management plan for teens. The truth is, I think it would work for you, but I'm not allowed to say that. I'm a pediatrician. I'm not licensed to treat adults. But uh, I think it would work for you. And this is a great way to build a college resume. Really, pay attention to the things on this resume. You're, there's going to be sports. There's going to be creative arts. There's going to be all of this stuff. You don't have to be the quarterback, because I don't care about that. But I do want your kids to be balanced. The first three categories. This is a 10 step up, 10 part plan, not 10 steps, 10 parts. The first thing is making the problem manageable. We've got to teach our kids, by the way, teaching kids, let's back up. When your kids are four, you teach them. You watch, you don't say, I am letting you play with crowns because I believe ultimately this will help you learn how to manage stress. No, just buy them the crowns. When they're seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11, do talk about how much better people when they express themselves. When they're 12 and 13, you can also have that conversation but intensify it. When they're 14 and 15, get out of the way. Get them a book, that's why I wrote it. Get them a book or go on the web you can get all, a lot of stuff for free um, for, um, to come up with stress reduction strategies. Then you know what you really do? You model it. Because you're coming home after a bad day and you're either going to run for the vodka or you're going to say, I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to call Ed Lowe's because I always feel better after I do that. Yeah, I definitely hope you help you do John's homework, darling. But first, I'm going to teach you some long, hot shower to detox yourself. We talk out loud about what we're doing. We give self-care and model how we, how we take care of ourselves without reaching for the beer. Next, now let's get to this problem. The first category is to make the problem manageable. All right? All problems feel overwhelming, and they can feel like catastrophes. And when we see some problem is overwhelming, we begin viewing it metaphorically as a mountain. When something's a mountain, you can't imagine climbing to the very top. You can't imagine circumnavigating around it. Instead, you fall at the base and you say, I can't. What we have to do is we have to help kids understand that every mountain is, in fact, a series of hills on top of each other. <coughs> 
All right? It's a series of hills. And all you have to do is climb onto the first hill. And if you're getting on the first hill, then the summit doesn't seem so far away, right? That's all you have to do is get up to one hill. So make a list. Make a timeline. Think about your situations and think about things that are completely overwhelming to you and break it down. Everybody hates me. Everybody. I have no friends, mommy. I'm going to run away. Everybody? Everybody. Well, what happened, darling? Well, Leia got mad at me, and Talia got mad at me, and Juanita got mad at me, and Takesha, she hates me now, and they're all talking about me. Yo, I don't understand why. How about Shoshana? Is she would. Yeah, she's still like my totally best friend. <laughs> okay? We can take almost any social catastrophe, break it down into some component parts, and make people understand that, they're, that they still um, can deal with it and manage it. Next, active avoidance. What we want is for kids to understand you don't have to take it all on. This comes from the drug literature. When I'm working with a kid with drugs and I put them back into the community, what do I do? I teach them about people, places, and things. I want them to know what are their triggers. What are the things that stress them out the most? Because if I know what, if they know what stresses them out the most, then um, I teach them how to avoid it. Why would you wait till your kids on drugs to do that? Why wouldn't you take your five-year-old and make him sit down and say, well, what's bothering you, Johnny? Johnny, do you really have to deal with that? If there's a bully on the corner, can you just walk around the up block so you don't have to deal with your hurt feelings? We can teach people that very early on in life. Next, letting some things go. You want kids to have this You want kids to have that can-do spirit. But I don't think you want kids to believe that they can handle anything and everything. Like some pure optimism, I can do anything. I'm like the energizer buddy. I think you waste a lot of energy. What we need to do is teach people to conserve energy, to help them to understand that there are things you can handle, there are things you can't handle, and you've got to let some things go. You know, you can't change the world, you can't change injustice, but you can work on your education. There are things I can personally handle. Next, there are four categories that. Um, all have to do with your body. These are key. Exercise. You are having, I, I have no idea how good a speaker he is, but I know he's one of the world's leaders in making brains work, and Dr. Rady was coming. He's an internationally renowned expert of ADD, and he has written an amazing book called Spark about the power of exercise in the mind. Why does it work so well? We have to remember what stress is. Stress is put into our bodies so that we can survive in the jungle. What's the worst thing that can happen to you in the jungle? You get eaten by the tiger, right? So we are designed to be able to flee from the tiger, all right? So think about it. What is the first physical sensation you have in your body when you are stressed? <coughs> heartbeat, maybe a second. There has to be, because heartbeat is making the blood go around your body. First, you have to get it from somewhere. Right now, there's a reason you guys are kind of tired besides it being late at night. You came after dinner. It's a very, very bad time to come to a talk because you've got 40% of your blood in your gut, okay? Where do you need the blood right now? I'm in my jungle chair. I'm in my jungle chair. Um, a tiger comes up to me. Where do I need the blood? I need it in my butt, which is my jumping muscle, and then I need it in my legs immediately after that. Okay, so first, what are butterflies? It's the feeling of the blood in your belly going whoop. Isn't that cool? <laughs> okay, then your heart beats fast to pump that blood. And then you breathe fast to oxygenate that blood and you sweat in order to cool off, right? And your pupils get big, why? So you can run over the lock without falling on it. And you can't think clearly when you're stressed out. Why is that? Because you're not supposed to turn to the tiger and say, you know, let's just work this out. So go cheat. Okay? So we are designed to be able to run. So when we are stressed, our bodies are saying, run. Therefore, what should we do when we're stressed? Run. You're listening to your body. When you don't run, what happens is those hormones circulate unused and confused, and they chew you up alive. When you do not, think about why people under stress have chronic stress or high blood pressure. I'm in my jungle chair. I haven't run. What do I, if, if I haven't run, the message that the adrenaline is sending my body is the tiger is still out there. You need to be able to run at any moment. What do I need to be able to do at any moment? 
I need to be able to jump, right? I need to be able to jump and escape. What do I need to be able to, what does my blood pressure need to be in order for me to jump at any moment? It needs to be high. So I am going to, if I have not escaped from the tiger, if I have not exercised, my adrenaline is circulating around my body, it will be replaced by cortisol, which will make me drink more, eat salty foods, and eat fatty foods to keep my blood pressure up so I can run from the lurking tiger that I've never escaped from. Isn't that kind of cool? So what we have to do is we have to teach people the power of exercise. Exercise, um, you know, it cures, uh, not cures, but treats ADD, treats depression, treats anxiety. Think about what anxiety is. There could be a tiger over there, or it could be over there. I don't know where a tiger could be. But when you're running, then what's happening is you're checking out and you're making sure that the village is okay and the village is safe. Make sense? Really important. Um, ADD, for me, I have to begin my day with, um, with some serious exercise. What is ADD? There are, we all come from the jungle. How did we survive in the jungle? We hunted. Imagine 20 people going into the jungle focused entirely on the deer. We're going to call them deer hunters. 20 people who are deer hunters focused entirely on the deer. Do they get the deer? Indeed they do. The deer is very, very dead. What happens to the men? 20 men in the jungle focused entirely on the deer. What happens to the men? They do eat. What else is in the jungle? Tigers. So they get eaten by the tiger as well, which means you need deer hunters and you need lookouts. People are gonna see the snakes, people are gonna see the tigers, people are gonna protect the village. Dude, I'm a lookout. All right, My, I am designed not to focus, I am designed to keep the rest of you safe. And when I, I'm a scout, and when I start my day exercising, going up hills and going down hills, I'm making sure the rest of you are safe. And when I've done that, I'm good for the day. I'm good till about eight or nine o'clock at night just from exercise. It's really key. Next, we need to teach people how to relax. To teach people how to relax, we need to understand how the human body works. The human body has two nervous systems. There's the I be chillin' system, which is the calm system, and there's the I better be running system. They cannot work together with one exception, which is male sexuality. Oh, this is just a show guy. But with that exception, they do not work together, which means that what we have to do is teach kids how to flip the switch. If we can only teach kids to do the opposite of what they do when they're stressed out, we can flip the switch and actually make them uh, relaxed. So go back to my jungle chair. Can you, what can you do the opposite of? Can you get the sweat back into your pits? Can you get the blood back into your belly? Can you slow down your heart rate even? Only if you do something else. What can you do easily? Breathe. Breathe. The key to relaxation is breath. The key to relaxation is learning to take a deep breath. Whether that is sitting in a bathtub and just putting your head underneath the water and taking breaths and making your lungs like balloons. Whether it is meditation, whether it's yoga, something that teaches you how to breathe will help kids learn to be relaxed. Take the four-year-old. The four-year-old's having a tantrum in class. What do we do with the four-year-old who's having a tantrum? Sit in the corner, don't do anything. Now you've lost recess, haven't you? Very, very, very dumb. Now, let's understand biology. And what should we do with the little four-year-old who's having a tantrum? What we should do is we should say, run it out, little man, run it out. We use up his hormones, we use up his adrenaline, and then we say, good, now blow some bubbles, and then we teach him how to use the power of breath and the power of exercise to control your body. Now, you can talk clearly and you can process his emotions. Got it? One example of man. Uh, we're in nutrition and sleep. I'm going to skip right now. The books will be available in the community. If not, I'll send you a PDF of these two chapters for people who don't want to buy books for feeling bad for sleep. Because I want to go to emotions. Um, there are two categories of dealing with emotions. The first is to just forget about them a little bit. Really let kids know that it's really, really okay to just take some instant vacations. To just um, get away from it all. The best instant vacation without a shadow of a doubt is reading a book. 
Why is reading a book so good? Reading a book is good because it's a full immersion experience. You have to imagine the panorama, you have to imagine the sights and imagine the sounds. You have to imagine the smells. You can't be distracted while you're reading a book. Everything else that we relax with, you can be distracted by. Listening to music, you can think about your problems, right? Working on a hobby, you can think about your problems. The book is an immersion experience. We've been talking a lot about stress today. I want to tell you that my fear for you guys has very little to do with your kids being stressed out. My fear for you has very little to do with your being stressed out. My real fear for your kids is not stress, it's that they become numb. It's that they stop caring. That is my fear. In the perfect world, I would work within your families, I would talk about the pain and the pressures within your families, and what are the forces that shut people down. In the less than perfect world, we're gonna talk about me. All right? And what it is that my life has looked like and how you have to overcome it. So I work at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, which is a very top rated, actually number one, for the US News and World Report, pediatric hospital. Which means what? It means that I'm very proud. Marilyn Ginsburg, that's my mom, she's very proud. But what it means really is that I have a serious imposter syndrome, because I think differently than other kids. And in the last 25 years that I've been there, 26 years, um, I have seen more death than you can begin to imagine. And I will tell you that I did not cry for seven years, from the second year of my residency until we found out that we were going to have babies. I will tell you that I did not cry for seven years. It was after one event that I'm definitely not going to share right now, because it still makes me feel vulnerable 25 years later. But one more event, which was I can't just take it anymore. This level of pain, I can't open myself up to. And now I'm an adolescent doctor. And I deal with all sorts of painful issues. I run a street and homeless clinic. I work with gang kids. Um, the kids I see are largely victims of racism, social economic injustice, more than anything else, probably homophobia, and angry about it. And now I'm a book author, dude man guy, and I have all sorts of responsibilities that are really kind of overwhelming. I mean, I can walk in the streets and people stop me and ask me advice. I get emails where people ask me all sorts of things that are unimaginable. All right, it's overwhelming. And here I am in Chicago today talking to you about how to help you manage stress with your kids. And then for an hour on the phone, I was doing it for myself. But guess who's not home tonight? <laughs> Me. So am I a good dad? It's not so, actually I am a really good dad. <laughs> but am I a good husband? That's not so clear. Because you know when I, I give every ounce of energy to my patients, to, 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 to teaching, and then to my children, and I always kind of feel like, Celia, can I pay attention to you this weekend, or maybe after your kids go to college, and <laughs> uh, what do you see? A mess. Give me a word. Mess. It's chaos. It's a mess. And if you've ever met anybody who doesn't have a container around that chaos, they're absolutely nuts. All right? That's what you say, how was your day? It was awful! All right, so what we do is we build uh, a wall around our container. Uh, we build a container around the chaos under the false belief that we are going to be able to deal with the problem later. So you go into another room, you see another patient, their lives are devastated. And you know, you can't focus on that because you've got to see a patient next. So you say, I'll do it later. No, really, I will. And you put it in there, but you don't. And as a result, what happens is you have to build thicker and thicker walls. Thicker and thicker walls under the false belief that you're going to deal with things, but you never do. And when those walls become so thick, they become what I call a leaden box. Lead because even a little bit of lead in your system is toxic, and lead because even Superman can't see through lead, and lead is too heavy to lift. And when the most passionate themes of human existence are trapped inside of a box that you do not ex access emotionally, you stop feeling and you become numb. And that is why so many doctors become jerks. They're the most loving, passionate people. I'm on an admissions committee at the medical school. They're the sweetest people in the world, but you can only get exposed to so much pain before you begin shutting down. This is my nightmare. For, deal, for raising the people who are going to be authentically successful, who we want to be empathic, we want empathetic, we want them to be compassionate, we want them caring, we don't want them shutting down. So there's a better way. We want to build a different kind of container for kids. 
We want to promote containers, but we want kids to have Tupperware boxes. Tupperware, still a container, but the stuff inside it don't stay. Tupperware, you go through a process of Tupperware, you say, you know what, that's too much for me to eat tonight. I'm going to keep it in storage. But you know what, I'm going to eat this portion. I'm going to digest this portion tonight. I'm going to open my lid. I'm going to take out that digestible portion, and then I'm going to burp the box. <laughs> so by helping kids um, go through the process of emotional intelligence, which means talking about and naming what their emotions are. Best book on this is Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, of emotional intelligence. That we can have kids know, rather than having this chaos, because the only way to deal with this kind of pain is drugs. Only drugs turns down this level of chaos and helps your head to stop spinning. But if we help kids instead to be emotionally intelligent, to know what is going on inside of their head, to be able to name it, and to be able to say, don't deal with all of this at one time, deal with just this. And then to have the emotional tools to take it out and deal with it, then a kid is going to feel that there's no reason to become numb. I can process my emotions. Check it out because this is your upside down mountain. Remember strategy number one, breaking big mountains into metaphorical hills? This, in, this operationalizes that technique. So now, tell me, give me some strategies that allow kids to help with emotions, to process emotions. Crying, absolutely. What's the flip side of crying? Laughing, absolutely. Prayer, <laughs> writing things down. Writing down ideas and like letting them off your chest. What else? Talking to someone who's earned your trust, not just anybody, but someone who's really earned your trust. What else? Exercise, absolutely. Sleep, absolutely. All of the creative arts. You want to know how I feel, Dr. Ken? Here's my rap. Here is my um, picture. Here's my sculpture. Here's my dance. I'm not keeping it inside of my head. I'm expressing myself. When we look at school and we think about GPAs and we say to kids, because I've actually heard this often, I would love my kids to take art, but you know what? With the way they curve right now, the way they add extra points, it's going to bring your GPA down even if she gets an A. Well, you know what? This is the juice of life. This is what helps you learn to cope with life, is art. My kids are photographers. I have talked to them on cameras. I've upgraded them every two years. Now they have cameras better than anything I will ever buy for myself. Why? My job as a daddy is to teach perspective. Here is a picture. It's about all of you. Here is a different picture. It's about you and the forces around your life. What has changed? Only my perspective. The arts teach perspective and they teach sensitivity. So, or they allow sensitivity, they allow you to release emotions. The final part of the, of the stress reduction strategy is the Tikkun Olam piece, the contributing to the world. I want every kid to have as part of this plan what it is that they are doing to build a stronger community, what they're doing to help their neighbors, and what they're doing perhaps to help the environment. Why? So that they will be surrounded by thank yous rather than condemnation, and so that they will understand the joy of giving, which will allow them later to receive without sin. Couple closing points. So in this stress reduction plan, we've done cognitive stuff. We've helped kids break big problems into small pieces, avoid other problems altogether, and we've helped them know when to let things go. We've built strong bodies ready to handle stress by, having, by working on nutrition, working on sleep, working on exercise, and working on relaxation. We dealt with emotions by saying, sometimes just go. Just enjoy yourself. But sometimes, you better have some scratches in place to deal with the hard stuff. And you know what? You want to really understand perspective? Go out in the world and work with real people. Understand what they're going through. You'll understand your blessings, and people will hold you to high expectations. That's stress reduction. That's getting into college by doing the right thing. Sometimes, though, no matter what I'm going to say in this audience, resilience is still going to reach its limits. And the points I want to know, you to know is to look for these things. If you're looking at your child, if your child is getting straight A's, taking six AP classes, and looking forward to school, fantastic. If your kid's coming home with headaches and chest pain and dizziness and fatigue, if their grades are dropping, if they're hanging out with new friends, something's 
wrong. The most important thing for you to know as parents, and this is the hardest thing, I want you to be the front lines against adolescent depression. All right, here's what you need to know. Adolescent depression does not present the same way as adult depression. Adult depression, you know when one of your buddies is depressed. They stop calling you, they stop dating, they're tired all the time because they're sleeping too much or they're not sleeping enough, all right? Adolescents present that way half the time. The other half the time, they are enraged and they are irritable, and they are angry, and this is why you all miss them. Because normal adolescents are enraged, irritable, and angry. <laughs> and as a result, we parents miss the opportunity to save our kids' lives. <coughs> that is why we need to check in in other places. Depressed kids are, are irritable across the board. Normal kids are like, I hate you, mom. And then you drop them off in their, their school and they're like, Lila, I'm here. Right? And they're all happy to be there. They change their affect. These are the things. We trust our teachers. We talk to our teachers about what's going on. We create a community of teachers who understand that when a kid is troubled in school, don't sequester them away. Take them aside and say, hey, you used to be doing really well. What's going on in your life? We need multiple levels of protection for these kids because they present in different ways, okay? My job as a doctor, a lot of what I do is teach doctors and nurses and other health professionals how to recognize a kid in trouble. However they present, whether it's Dr. Ken, I'm feeling sad, which is very rare, or whether it's Dr. Ken, I'm really tired. I have headaches, that's why I'm not going to school. I want my colleagues to know how to work with your kids. Your own tolerance. Your own resilience is going to reach its limits. There are going to, you're going to love your kid to death, but it's okay to not always like it. It really is okay. What can you do for yourself when this happens? The first thing is to give yourself the opportunity to fall back in love. Remember that that child who's talking back to you, who's kind of really difficult today, is the same child who ran up the street and said, mommy's gone, mommy's gone, mommy's gone. It's the same kid who you held on the bike and you never wanted to let go because you didn't know she was going to fall down. It's the same kid who maybe made you say fall so they could leave with their mom's cousins and grandmas. It's the same kid. <laughs> fall back in love. Give yourself the opportunity to do so. In childhood, we know that when we discipline kids, what we're doing always is we are catching them being good and we're redirecting them when they're not. In adolescence, we focus on what kids are doing wrong, and we use our precious time while driving them between activities while we're trapped in our cars to talk about grades and product and success. Stop! Because if you're doing that, kid, you're not going to get to know who your kid is. They're going to be stressed, they're always going to feel hostile, they're always going to feel like you want something. Take a little instant vacation with your kids. Maybe it could be dinner every night. Maybe, or maybe it could be just dinner on uh, Friday night or Sunday. Okay, maybe it could just be dinner there where you're absolutely not allowed to talk about other things except being <coughs> and family and fun. Maybe take them fishing, maybe take them hiking, but give yourself that instant vacation to fall back in love so your kid can begin showing you who they are in that. Never forget to hold your, um, your kids to the highest expectations in terms of their soulfulness, and don't forget to honor your spouse and partner because you are trying to raise a healthy and successful 35-year-old. That is your job in parenting, which means that the greatest gift you could possibly give your child is to show them what a well-balanced, healthy 40-year-old looks like. We live in a generation, remember the beginning slide? We're saying like, you know, who is childhood for? We are so tormented. The men, you know, my dad spent 1 50th or less of the amount of time that I spent with my children. But I live in a generation where I'm supposed to be all things to everybody. I'm supposed to be as sensitive as the women and I'm still supposed to be the breadwinner. It's even harder to be a woman. We are so confused because we feel guilty when we're not at work and we feel guilty when we're not at home. We feel guilty all the time. And as a result, we give our kids everything and we self-sacrifice because we feel so guilty about not being who we wish we could be, that we're just self-sacrificing. I don't really matter, as long as she's happy now, that's all that matters to me, that's how I'm gonna define success. No. Your children are looking at you to see what a healthy adult is. 
And the greatest gift you can give your child is to show them a well-balanced adult who's living adult lives and adult relationships. You're the model. The greatest gift you can give your child is to take care of yourself. It is not a selfish act. It is a selfless and strategic act of good parenting. It begins by showing them how you manage stress. It begins by showing them how you manage um, uh, um, success in your own life, how you view success, and how you absorb pressure. It begins with acknowledging that you're uneven. It begins also with coming home and saying, I'm taking a run, I'm taking a bath. I so do want to help you, but I can't help you unless I'm strong myself first. I need to go take care of myself. Guys, I apologize.